We're going to start with this afternoon's program, and the first speaker is Ed Heinsen. And I remember when I was in seminary, I bought a book called Emmanuel's Isaiah. No, Isaiah's Emmanuel. Thank you. <laughs> and by Presbyterian Reformed, of all publishers. And it was a defense of uh, Isaiah 714 being messianic and a few other issues involved as well. And um, Ed hasn't changed his view of that since it shows he's a slow learner, right? And, uh, but he's going to present uh, that material. And, of course, he's a contributor to the uh, messianic uh, book that just came out on Messianic Prophecy, and Ed, of course, is the dean. He's a bigwig at uh, Liberty. He's been there many years, and he's written many, many books, done study Bibles and all those kind of things, <clears throat> and has, is the dean of the School of Theology at Liberty. So, Ed, come on and uh, make up for my introduction of you. <laughs> all right, thank you. So hopefully after lunch uh, you are re-energized and not totally asleep uh, and ready to go. Uh, and uh, again, it's uh, an honor to be able to speak to you today on this subject. Now we have made available to you the PDF form of that entire book, uh, Isaiah's Emmanuel, uh, <clears throat> over a hundred pages of a detailed study that was originally a dissertation that I did under Dr. Kaiser uh, at Trinity also under Gleason Archer, who disagreed with me uh, and disagreed with Dr. Kaiser. Uh, and at my defense, they got into a kind of Pharisee-Sadducee thing back and forth. Uh, and uh, suddenly Archer remembered he had a dental appointment he had to go to because he was losing to Dr. Kaiser. Uh, and uh, I was like cheering him on. So, uh, but it was a real honor to study under both of them. Uh, I was newly married, young, um, first year in seminary. Uh, and discovered this unknown professor that I'd never heard of before, Walter Kaiser. And uh, I took one course under him and thought, this is the smartest teacher I've ever studied under. I'm going to take everything he has. And took five courses in one year uh, from him. So it's also an honor for us to have him here uh, as uh, the next speaker uh, after me today. Now, <clears throat> initially, I told Tom... What I really want to talk about is Isaiah 9 and 11. Those are two of the chapters that I contributed to the Messianic Handbook uh, for Moody, uh, as well as the one on chapter 61. Uh, but he asked me to also address uh, chapter 7. That chapter in the handbook uh, was done by Dr. Radelnik himself. But uh, I would like to begin by reframing why we're here today, uh, why a organization that normally focuses on eschatological prophecies, uh, mainly related to the Second Coming, are dealing with Messianic prophecies uh, in particular, and that's because this has become a new area of challenge, one might say controversy or even debate, uh, in evangelical circles. Now, when I explain that to laymen, they're usually shocked. What do you mean the virgin birth prophecy is not about Jesus? What do you mean a wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace? That's not about Jesus? Uh, who in the world would say such a thing? Well, non-believers uh, certainly might say such a thing. Uh, but uh, today, it is not unusual for those that would say, I believe in the gospel. Uh, I, I believe in personal salvation uh, through, uh, by faith through grace. Uh, that I believe in uh, uh, the inspiration of Scripture. I just don't believe these passages are essentially messianic in nature. So this is not just a discussion between believers and non-believers, but this is a discussion within uh, the household of faith. Uh, for example, uh, Tremper Longman, uh, who teaches at Westmont, uh, has said of the Old Testament, 
it is impossible to establish that any passage in its original literary and historical context must or even should be understood as portending a future messianic figure. In other words, there are no Old Testament prophecies that are clearly or obviously about the Messiah. Now, you said you're going to follow me. There you go. Okay, you're on. Uh, give him a chance to see that one, and we'll go to the next one. Next quote, Kyle Snodgrass. The early church applied such texts to Jesus because of their conviction about his identity. The conviction about his identity did not derive from the Old Testament. They found Jesus and then saw how the scriptures fit with him. In other words, Jesus is a secondary application of the passage. Uh, John Walton from Wheaton said, How can we identify a passage as messianic if the Old Testament offers no such support for such an interpretation, either conceptually or textually, and the New Testament suggests no fulfillment connections? So with some of those prophecies, there's a direct statement in the New Testament that this is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Sometimes there is not such a statement of fulfillment, but rather a drawing of a parallel concept, uh, as Dr. Price illustrated uh, for us in relation to uh, Genesis 3 uh, in the earlier message. So what has happened is a slow eroding of these things in a general evangelical departure from the Messianic view of the Old Testament. Dr. Radelnik has said, there is a growing movement by evangelicals away from interpreting the Hebrew Bible as a Messianic book. Although evangelical scholarship still recognizes that there is something Messianic about the Hebrew Bible, for the most part, it sees it as a story that finds its climax in Jesus not as a prediction that Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled. As such, it is becoming quite common to state that the biblical authors did not have an intentional messianic meaning. Now again, if you've not read uh, commentaries or articles or materials that are dealing with this, this may be a bit of a surprise to you. Uh, but this is very commonly done. In uh, preparing the articles I did uh, for the handbook, uh, I was reading through a ton of material and would often find evangelical writers who would come right up to the passage and then slide around it. Uh, in some cases, talk about the messianic trajectories in the book of Isaiah and make no comment on chapter 7. No comment, in some cases, on chapter 61, which Jesus said, was fulfilled in him uh, today at the synagogue in Nazareth. Uh, Jesus thought those prophecies had something to do with him. Uh, as was quoted earlier uh, in Luke 24, after the resurrection, Jesus told the disciples that if you'll search uh, the law and the prophets and the Psalms, the threefold division of the Hebrew Bible, you will find that it's all about me. And yet all too often, uh, unbelievers have said, I don't think that's what those passages were all about in the first place. Now, it's not uncommon, as we'll see in a moment, in unbelieving Jewish circles, non-Messianic circles, uh, since the Middle Ages to suggest that many of these passages were never about the Messiah in the first place. Therefore, they couldn't possibly be about Jesus because they were not about the Messiah, because if they were about the Messiah, they sure sound like they were about Jesus. So it's kind of a circular reasoning, but that's commonly done in what's called anti-missionary literature uh, in Israel, uh, that it wasn't about the Messiah in the first place. And I could understand, if I were Jewish, now we're not a Christian believer, I did not believe Jesus was the Messiah, that might sound like a logical explanation for some things. But then as that influence began to spread in Europe, then by the 19th century, German liberalism picks that up, and they start saying, these passages are not about Jesus. And then pretty soon the British liberals pick it up, 
And pretty soon the American liberals pick it up. And today, in most liberal commentaries, these things will be assumed as if they are factual. And in the last 40 years, that kind of thinking has continued to leak into evangelical circles as well. My personal opinion is because many of our scholars spend so much time reading the other side uh, that it influences them more than reading the Bible. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, they think I have to in some way uh, interact with the challenges uh, of these passages. I argued 40 years ago that if you give up on Isaiah 7, the virgin birth, you'll give up on Isaiah 9, you'll give up on 11, and pretty soon you'll eventually give up on 53. And there are people today that have given up on everything but 53, and there are others that have been ready to give up on that as well. Well, you give up the high ground of the messianic view, you're backing down, I think, to an accommodation to unbelief that's going to leave you uh, with an Old Testament that has virtually nothing to say directly about the person of Jesus Christ. And then you raise the question, why did Jesus seem to think that it was about him if we think it really was not about him? Uh, one illustration of this, uh, during the Civil War, I grew up in Michigan, so I don't pay much attention to the Civil War, but I live in Virginia where its history is all around me. And one of the fundamental mistakes the Confederate Army made when they had the high ground at Mission Ridge in Chattanooga uh, up at Lookout Mountain, they backed down the mountain all the way to Atlanta and ultimately all the way to Savannah. And it was only a matter of time till they lost the war. As soon as they gave up the high ground of that position and moved to the low ground, they moved to a point of defeat. And I think the challenge for Christian scholarship in our day and age is if we give up the high ground of the messianic understanding of the Old Testament, you're going to eliminate a Christocentric understanding of what the Old Testament is really all about, and ultimately you're going to undermine Jewish evangelism. Virtually every messianic believer that I've ever met and talked to personally will say, I came to faith in Jesus because I was finally convinced Yeshua was Hamashiach, that Jesus really was the Messiah, that he was the fulfillment of those prophecies. So in light of that, I want to take us through the entire section uh, of the Emmanuel prophecies that I would suggest run all the way from Isaiah 7 through chapter 9. I'll read just a comment from uh, my article on chapter 9. The messianic trajectory of the prophet Isaiah extends from the prediction of the birth of Emmanuel in 714 to the divine child in 96 and culminates in the future Davidic king in chapter 11. Taken as a unit, the Emmanuel prophecies from chapters 7 to 12 paint a picture of a coming messianic king. His birth is unique, 714. His character is majestic, 9-6. His land is threatened, 8-8. And his triumph is assured in chapter 11, verse 4. The thematic context of these chapters taken together drives us from the birth of the child to the reign of the king. In 714, the sign is given, Emmanuel, God with us. In chapter 8, verse 8, there's a reference to the land of Emmanuel, which is being threatened, which to me only makes sense if Emmanuel is a reference to Jesus himself, to the king. Uh, the divine child in chapter 9, who is both the prince of peace uh, and the El Gabor, the mighty God, etc. Uh, the remnant that returns in 1021 are returning to the El Gabor, to the mighty God. In chapter 11, the branch of Jesse will rule in peace and righteousness. And finally, in chapter 12, the crescendo of praise is reached where they're worshiping God, singing, shouting, and praising to Yahweh, the 
God Almighty, the Lord who is the Holy One of Israel, who is with us, and pulls the Emmanuel theme back together again at the end of chapter 12. So my suggestion is that all of this fits together as a unit, and that it's a mistake to pick a verse here, pick a verse there, and try to understand them separately when that whole section seems to be put together thematically. And those of you that are familiar with the book of Isaiah, the whole book is put together that way. There are thematic sections of prophecies about the nations, uh, thematic sections about prophecies of judgment and blessing, uh, the woes that are pronounced. That's a whole series of prophecies. And these prophecies are put together deliberately to drive us from the birth of the child to the reign of the king. The historical issue that is the backdrop of Isaiah 7 uh, has to do with the saro ephraimatic War that took place between 734 and 732 BC in which Assyria, the major power, was putting pressure on Syria, the city of Damascus, and in turn on Samaria, the capital of northern Israel, and the kings of Samaria and Damascus had formed an alliance against the Assyrians. They were trying to get Judah to join the alliance and they were putting pressure on Ahaz, the king of Judah, join the alliance against uh, Syria and if you don't, we're going to kill you. We're going to remove the line of the Davidic kings and we're going to place somebody else on the throne. The course of the Assyrian conquest was the imminent destruction of Aram or Syria, Aramea, and Israel and an Assyrian progress of invasion that would come through Israel even unto Judah itself and then as you read on in the book of Isaiah is turned back in the days of Hezekiah. The immediate threat that's in the context of chapter 7 involves Rezin, the king of Damascus, king of Syria, Pekah of the Samaria, the king of northern Israel, the alliance against Ahaz, the king of Judah, and the threat was to remove him and replace him with the son of Tabil, which no commentator seems to know who in the world that was, and cut off the Davidic line. So I want you to remember that. The threat is we're going to eliminate not just this king, but this entire line. Well, the line of David is the messianic line. That is the line that would lead to Christ. And as Randy pointed out to us in the conflict between uh, Satan, the serpent, and the seed of the woman, there have always been these attempts to eliminate the line. And I think it's the line uh, that is at stake uh, in the passage. Now, if you have your Bible, you might take it and turn to Isaiah chapter 7. I'll just quickly read the context, and then we'll get to the issue of the virgin birth prophecy. Isaiah 7, verse 1, reading from the ESV, in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, the king of Judah, southern kingdom, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, northern Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not mount an attack against it. And when the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook like the trees of the forest shake before the wind. And then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out and meet Ahaz, you and Shiriashib, your son. And you might underline his name or remember him. He's kind of the forgotten person in the story. The prophet is a young prophet at this time. He's going to show up with a child, a small child, who's just been born uh, previously. Uh, and the question is then raised by Messianic believers, why would you take a little boy with you to confront the king of Jerusalem? Go and meet him at the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field and say to him, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, do not let your heart faint because of those two smoldering stumps of firebrands, etc., uh, that are coming against you. In other words, calm down, relax. The invasion is not going to succeed. 
even though they have said in verse 6, let us go up against Judah, terrify it, let us conquer it for ourselves, and set up the son of Tabeel as king in the midst of it. The Lord God says, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, the head of Damascus is Rezin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken to pieces so that it will no longer be a people. That's almost inserted as kind of a footnote at that point, that eventually even the northern kingdom will collapse. Uh, and the head of Ephraim is Samaria. The head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. If you are not firm in faith, that was the challenge to Ahaz. Are you going to believe God or not? You will not be firm at all. The old uh, Scottish translation says, if you have not staff, you'll have not faith. If you have not faith, you have not staff, uh, etc. In other words, if you don't believe, you'll cave into anything and everything that comes along. Well, if Ahaz is challenged to believe the promise of God, how much more are we? Now, most of you know the passage from verse 10 on. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz and said, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. And that implies a miraculous sign. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Kind of false piety. I, I don't want to bother God. I think he's thinking, preacher, get out of here and leave me alone. I have a war to fight. I'm trying to reinforce the water system. I'm trying to make sure we survive the invasion. Uh, don't bother me right now. Why do you have that kid with you? Uh, Etc. Uh, and then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men? But would you weary my God also? Therefore... The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin, and in the Hebrew it has the direct article there, Ha-Elma, shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And he shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted, uh, etc. But the Lord will bring on you and your father's house, he goes on to say something worse, the king of Assyria. Now, that's the context of the passage itself. The immediate context, Isaiah takes the young son, Shiriashib, to meet King Ahaz, or Ahaz, however you pronounce that, at the upper pool. The prophetic promise is, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, it shall not stand, it shall not come to pass. But then the king refuses the sign, whether it's in the depth of Sheol or in the height of heaven itself. I don't want to hear it. People ask all the time, well, what was the relevance of the prediction of the virgin birth of Jesus 700 years later to King Ahaz? I'm not sure there had to be any relevance to it. He was saying, in essence, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Leave me alone, preacher. Get out of here. Uh, I don't want your sign. There's an interesting parallel that has often been observed between Ahaz and Hezekiah. Both of them face a threat. Ahaz from Syria and Ephraim. Hezekiah in chapter 36 from Assyria. Both of them have a promise that it will not succeed or that the invader will not enter the city. Both have a prediction that the kings involved would be removed or in the case of the king of Assyria, Sennacherib would be removed. The location of both events takes place at the same spot, at the upper pool. Both kings are trying to reinforce the water system at a time of invasion. The sign to Ahaz is rejected. The sign later given to Hezekiah is received. So the contrast between the unfaithfulness of Ahaz and the faith of Hezekiah. 
the unbelief of Ahaz, the belief of Hezekiah, the one who received the message from the prophet, the one who rejected the message of the prophet. Uh, the parallel, I think, becomes very obvious and very deliberate. The Emmanuel prophecy itself, again, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which Matthew, when he quotes it, then translates it for his readers, God with us. The interpretive views of the passage throughout church history were essentially messianic. Jewish views later became very non-messianic, and then eventually the non-messianic views began to influence people of a more liberal Christian position until ultimately you come up with what's called the dual fulfillment view, a view that many of you may have been taught even in school yourself. Uh, the messianic view is Isaiah was predicting the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. That's the view of all the early church fathers. That's the view of all the medieval Catholic theologians. That's the view of all the reformers. That's the view of all the revivalists, the Puritans, uh, etc. The non-messianic view says this is not about a virgin birth. This is about the birth of a child in the days of the prophet Isaiah. Uh, in his own lifetime, that all he was saying to Ahaz was, uh, in the amount of time a virgin could get pregnant and have a baby, and the baby grow to the age of discernment, the enemy will be gone, the problem will be over with, and this has nothing to do with Jesus at all. Uh, the influence of the non-Messianic view grew so strongly in your mainline theological schools over the centuries that it eventually led to the dual fulfillment view that maybe it's both. Maybe it immediately referred to the birth of a child in those days, but then ultimately, secondarily, it refers to the birth of Jesus. So that we don't give up on the birth of Jesus, but it's not the essential emphasis of the prophecy itself. The non-Messianic view says that it refers to any woman or any child. That's one option. In the amount of time any woman got pregnant, had a baby, the enemy will be gone, the problem will be over with. Or secondly, that it refers to the birth of Hezekiah, that the son of Ahaz, Hezekiah, would be a godly king, and therefore it's possibly about him. Most scholars point out that chronologically at the time the prophecy is given, Hezekiah was already about nine years old. So it can't really be about him unless you don't care about the chronology. And some liberal commentators don't. They're like, so he got the chronology wrong. Uh, so what? Uh, Etc. Or it refers to the birth of Isaiah's son in the next chapter. Mahar Shalal Hashbaz, speed the spoil, hasten the prey which is not exactly Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, but nevertheless, because he refers to that child uh, and his children as signs to the nation of Israel, some people jump to the chapter uh, that follows and say, well, there's the answer. It's got to be Maher Shalah Ashbaz that he was talking about, uh, etc. Interesting to read John Calvin's comment on this in his commentary uh, on Isaiah because there were Jewish scholars that were saying that in Calvin's time, to which Calvin responded, as to those who think it was Isaiah's son, it is an utterly frivolous conjecture, for we do not read that a deliverer would be raised up from the seed of Isaiah. That the son of Isaiah is a sign of something very different than the promise of the child that is given in chapter 7. Now, if you look at the material that I've given you on the PDF, if you look at a long line of Christian commentaries in one column, Messianic, it's like dozens and dozens and dozens for centuries. And then non-Messianic, in Christian circles, you begin to see glimmers of it in the late 1700s, 1800s, and then it's really getting traction in liberal circles uh, in the 20th century. And then, in the meantime, one person that I could find comes up with a double fulfillment view, uh, Albert Barnes in 1840. 
Uh, those of you that are familiar with the whole dispensational argument uh, would recognize one of the arguments always used is, uh, your guy's idea was new uh, in about 1830 or 40. So is this. Uh, Albert Barnes in 1840 said, the child of the prophet about to be born, Mahar Shalal Hashbaz, is the first fulfillment of this. He suggested that Isaiah's first wife had died, an argument from silence, and he was about to remarry a virgin, and admits that the prophecy was never really completely fulfilled. If you'll read Barnes' notes on Isaiah, he was the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, wrote extensive notes and commentaries on the entire Bible. Barnes says, uh, in my first edition, I did not believe Isaiah 7.14 was messianic. I did not believe it was about Jesus. But I've now changed my mind. And I think it's both about the son of the prophet and about Jesus. Now, he doesn't tell why he changed his mind. I can only imagine he probably got a lot of flack uh, from the elders at the Presbyterian Church. I'm not sure. Uh, but be that as it may, he comes up with what I call the dead wife, new wife theory. Uh, that uh, the first wife of Isaiah must have died, and he married a second wife, who at the time he was about to marry her was still a virgin. So this gets into the whole issue of the meaning of Alma, the word for virgin in the passage, does it really mean virgin or does it not? So if it does, then the only way to get around this is to say, this is another virgin. Now there are other approaches to this. Uh, Nagelsbach and Lang's commentary has an odd view of his own, uh, that the virgin is one of the virgin girls in the harem of King Hezekiah, or excuse me, King Ahaz, uh, and uh, uh, she's not yet gotten pregnant, uh, and uh, she's about to get pregnant. Or, in another place, he suggests she got pregnant, but not by him. Uh, and it was going to shock him uh, to find this out. So the prophet is dropping this bomb on him uh, when he gives this message to him, uh, etc. There have been all kinds of attempts to try to explain this. Now, I've been in the ministry for 50 years. I I've heard every kind of wild speculation about everything imaginable. I've also heard every kind of accommodation that when unbelief rears its head strongly, Christians tend to back down and feel like I have to meet unbelief halfway. If I could accommodate my view uh, in some other way than uh, accepting that creation means creation, uh, or that fulfillment means fulfillment, uh, etc., uh, then maybe I can get a more reasonable hearing for what I'm trying to say about Jesus. But my suggestion is once you leave the high ground, and you start backing down, you'll back down all the way to unbelief. Until pretty soon, it isn't about Jesus at all. Now, what I found among most liberal commentaries is, the commentator does not himself believe there ever was a virgin birth in the first place. So why should he believe that Isaiah is predicting a virgin birth? He doesn't believe the virgin birth ever happened. It's a biological impossibility. It's contrary to the laws of science. Uh, it could never have happened, therefore it did not happen. It never happened. And this is not what the passage is about. And I can understand. I don't agree, but I can understand why an unbeliever might say that. But why would a believer feel like I somehow have to accommodate my position in order to gain a hearing for the credibility of my position because what you find is you often don't gain any acceptance anyway. An uh, interesting example of that, the brand new archaeological study Bible uh, published by Crossway, done by the best of evangelical scholars, won the gold medallion award uh, from the Christian Publishers Association but the review of it in Biblical Archaeology Review rips it to shreds and says it's worthless, uh, it doesn't even deserve any kind of academic recognition at all, uh, et cetera, et cetera, because there's no contrary opinion given by non-evangelicals uh, in this study Bible. Now, I would say, well, what did you expect? Uh, didn't you realize that's what was going to happen? 
So sometimes we can pride ourselves on what we think is an intellectual understanding of something when in reality it doesn't even dent the heart and soul and mind of unbelief. Now, the real interpretive question in Isaiah 7 is then, all right, who's the mother in the passage? Is it the wife of Ahaz and the child is then Hezekiah? Is it Isaiah's first wife? Is it a new wife who's unmentioned in Scripture? Uh, is it a virgin in the king's harem? Or is it the Virgin Mary, which has been the traditional Christian understanding of the passage for centuries? Now, the word virgin that's used in the text is a rare word in the Old Testament. Elma is a unique Hebrew word. It's only used eight times in the Old Testament, but it's never used of a married woman. It's a young woman or maiden of marriageable age who is, in fact, a virgin. Now, you'll see tons of material written on this. People will say, the word doesn't mean virgin at all. It only means young woman. So the Revised Standard Version changed the translation back in the 1940s or 50s to read, a young woman will be pregnant and have a child and name him Emmanuel. People got upset and rejected the RSV translation uh, on the basis of that one verse, basically, uh, etc. It does mean a young woman, but it means a young woman who is indeed a virgin. If you go to the Jewish Study Bible, published by Oxford University Press, it will say this, all modern scholars agree, that's not true, uh, that the Hebrew merely denotes a young woman of marriageable age, whether a virgin or not. Now, I have great respect for the Jewish people. I uh, spent a whole bunch of time last summer uh, in Israel, ministering to people, uh, speaking at the National uh, Prayer Breakfast of Jerusalem, uh, etc. Uh, but uh, the challenge when you go to their study materials, like the Jewish Study Bible, every single time you come to a Messianic passage, it'll explain it away. That Christians don't understand this properly, this is a total misunderstanding, and in some cases, they won't even comment on the passage at all. It has often been argued, well, if he really meant virgin, he would have used the more common Hebrew word for virgin, which is betula. Uh, but while it is the more common word, it is a less precise word. Uh, Matyer, Alec Matyer, in his commentary on Isaiah, says only 21 of the 50 usages of betula definitively mean virgin. Without a descriptive clause added, Betula does not convey a precise meaning. In fact, twice Betula is used of a young widow in Deuteronomy 22 and in Joel chapter 1. Uh, if I did not believe in the virgin birth, and I did not believe this prophecy was about the virgin birth, and he had used the word Betula, what would I probably say? Oh, it's not a precise word. Uh, it can mean a young widow. Uh, and its meaning is always determined by its context, uh, etc. So if you're determined not to believe it, you're going to get rid of it no matter what the word is. Now, one of the challenges is, what does the term shall conceive mean? Edward Young, famous scholar from Westminster Seminary, and his commentary on Isaiah argues that hara is a feminine adjective with an active participle, bearing. It denotes a present tense experience in the mind of the prophet. Behold, the pregnant virgin bearing a son. In other words, the prophet sees the future as though it were already happening presently before his eyes and refers to her as a pregnant virgin, which is a contradiction of terms unless this is a miraculous virginal conception. Now, Good people differ on how that verbal phrase ought to be interpreted. Uh, and uh, if that is true, if his view is correct, that's kind of a slam dunk for the virgin birth interpretation. But be that as it may, I think we can find the emphasis on what he's talking about, that it's not Hezekiah, it's not the son of the prophet, that he's talking about this messianic figure that would come in the future who will do what? Sustain the line of King David. 
the Davidic line, the Messianic line. That's what's being threatened. Let's kill the king. Let's put a non-Davidic king on the throne who will agree with us. Then the question is, who is Emmanuel? Is it Hezekiah? Is it Maher Shalai Ashbaz? Is it no one in particular? Or is it Jesus? Which Matthew, his own personal disciple, seemed to think that it was. Uh, and it has always amazed me that people want to argue, well, Matthew, you know, those guys weren't that smart, uh, and they made a lot of mistakes, uh, and he probably got this wrong, and he was probably following the Septuagint in the first place, and that sure wasn't a good idea. But I like to remind them, Matthew was a tax collector who could read and write before he was converted. His Jewish name technically was what? Levi. He's probably raised in a priestly family. He was somebody that would have known these things, understood these things, and interprets them and translates them. And then you add to that Jesus' statement in Luke 24 that all the law, the prophets, and the Psalms are all about me. And then he taught them from the scriptures which prophecies were about himself. Now, if Jesus taught them, and Matthew was a recipient of that as one of his personal disciples, I have a lot more confidence in Matthew than I do in a whole line of scholars that have struggled over this for the last hundred years. Matthew, in the Greek New Testament, quotes the passage and uses the Greek word parthenos for virgin. It always means virgin. In the Septuagint, they translate this as Parthenos as well. In fact, there are even references among some of the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, that are in Greek that use Parthenos for Elma, that this is a common thing to do. In other words, you cannot prove because he used Elma, a rare word for virgin, he didn't mean virgin because the Septuagint says that he did. Matthew says that he did. All the early church commentators said that he did. Then you go to a contemporary of Isaiah, Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, the famous prophecy about Bethlehem. He's a contemporary who predicts the place of the Messiah's birth. If Isaiah predicts the fact of it, Micah predicts the place of it. She who is in labor, present tense, shall give birth to a ruler in Israel. That's a king whose origin is from antiquity, from eternity, olam, which is only used of God in the Old Testament. So Micah seems to be saying God is going to come from eternity, from antiquity, and is going to be born, a, a divine child of some sort, in Bethlehem. Well, I think that's the whole point that Isaiah and Micah collectively are trying to make. The immediate relevance, the removal of the threat, uh, that the child was either an ideal child, Hezekiah, Maher Shalohashbaz, or Shir Yashib, I think the answer to all of that is, it's not just any child. It's a child that represents God is with us. Now, taken literally, it sounds like the Incarnation. Deity incarnate, God on foot, God in a robe, a baby in a basket in a barn in Bethlehem, uh, etc. Uh, I don't think it's Hezekiah. He never lives up to any of this. And I don't think it's Maher Shalah Hashbaz because he's not a sign of this and his birth has nothing to do with the promise of maintaining the Davidic line, which is the issue in chapter 7. Uh, these issues in the prophecy often clutter our understanding of the whole thing because it doesn't end with the seventh chapter. In chapter 8, Maher Shail Hashbaz is born. Damascus and Samaria are said to fall. Assyria will come to Israel, which they did in 722 B.C. Assyria will threaten Judah, your land, O Emmanuel. Now, you wouldn't refer to the land of Judah as the land of the prophet's son, I don't think. You'd refer to it in a more Davidic context that it has something to do with the line of the kings. But, don't worry, he says, 
because God is with us. Look at chapter 8 in your Bible and look at verse 8. That will sweep into Judah. It will overflow and pass on, reaching even up to the neck as its outspreading wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. Then you have a poetic response. Be broken, you peoples. Be shattered, etc. Then he says in verse 10, take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. Emmanuel. There's the emphasis again. He's bringing you right back to the point of all five of these chapters together uh, that are driving home this point. God is going to come and be the rescuer. Then you go to chapter 9, and in chapter 9, how does it open? Verse 1, there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish in the former time. He brought them into contempt in the land of Zebulon and Naphtali, those are the northern tribes in the Galilee. But in the latter time, he has made a glorious way of the sea in the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The only place in the Old Testament Galilee appears. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Here in the ninth chapter, uh, we have the great light that will shine in Galilee and Matthew quotes this in the fourth chapter of his gospel in relation to Jesus launching his ministry in where? Galilee. Luke quotes it in Luke 179 as the great light. Both Luke and Matthew see a messianic connection to Jesus from Isaiah chapter 9. And it's in this context that he says in verse 6, For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. That's definitely not Maher Ashmas. That has to be somebody from the royal line. And his name shall be called, and you have this fourfold descriptive title of him, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and his peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David, so he's talking about a king, over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth forevermore, meata olam. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The power of God himself, the Lord himself, will make this happen and bring this to pass. You have in 9.6 what I believe is the prediction of the divine child that will come. The wonderful counselor, the Pela Yoetz, the mighty God, the El Gabor. Again, some commentators try to say, well, that just means a mighty hero, a mighty man. But we'll see in a moment in chapter 10, no, that phrase is actually used of God himself. Uh, and then uh, he's the father of eternity, the Abiyad, and he's the Sar Shalom the Prince of Peace. Now, there are current scholars that say, well, if you look at the contemporary ancient Near Eastern literature of the time, uh, there was a tendency in Egypt to give fourfold titles to the kings, the titulary titles, and a personal name, and that that's really all this is. This doesn't mean the child is the mighty God. This doesn't mean the child is a wonder of a counselor. This doesn't mean he's literally a prince of peace. These are like divine titles that are applied to your name because the pharaohs thought they were God. Uh, and uh, therefore, apparently, that's what uh, Isaiah was saying about Hezekiah. You look in almost any liberal commentary, they're going to say this is all about Hezekiah. This is who he is, not who Jesus is. Unfortunately, uh, in a current edition of a book on Messianic prophecy, uh, one professor who writes on this section says, well, I think Isaiah really had Hezekiah in mind. And he thought it would eventually he'd be the one. But when he wasn't, he left the wording open, is the phrase he uses, so it could maybe later mean somebody else like Jesus, uh, whatever. Now, without 
picking on people by name. He teaches at a school that's located very close here. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, I think that again is an accommodation to unbelief that you don't need to make. I know they're well-meaning, believe it or not. I think these guys think if I meet the unbelief halfway, I, I, I can hook them and still get them to Jesus. Man, if you're going to get them to Jesus as a secondary fulfillment of all of this, why, if I'm Jewish, would I ever believe Jesus is the Messiah? He's got to be the Savior. He's got to be the one it's talking about. When you go into the 10th chapter, Assyria will be judged with a wasting sickness. That takes place in chapters 36 and 37 in the days of Hezekiah. But a remnant of Israel shall return. That's the Shiryashib name. And who are they going to return to? 1021 to the El Gabor, the mighty God. He's stringing the whole thing together from chapter 7 all the way through chapter 12. When you come to chapter 11, it's the prophecy of the righteous branch. Uh, there will come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Jesse was David's father, so the line of David. And a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, the Netzer branch. Uh, Jeremiah is going to say the same thing. He's going to refer to the branch as the righteous branch that will come in the future. And the Ruach Yahweh, the Spirit of the Lord, shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and might. Oh, that sounds like chapter 9, verse 6. Uh, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked, which is exactly what Jesus does in Revelation, the 19th chapter. When Christ returns, he slays the army of the Antichrist with the sword of his mouth, the power of his spoken word. Uh, that all of the prophecies of the first coming are then linked to the hope of the prophecies of the second coming. That eventually a child is going to be born of a virgin, a child who is Emmanuel, God with us, who is in fact not only titled by these four descriptions, but is the epitome of those four descriptions. He's the wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God, the father of eternity, the prince of peace, etc. He is coming to deliver the land, the land of who? Of Emmanuel, because it's God's land. And then when you come to chapter 12, the anointed Messiah is the coming king, anointed by the Spirit of the Lord, endowed with his gifts, and comes to reign and rule, and you have this closing crescendo in the 12th chapter where all of this message builds and builds and builds to a final exclamation of praise. Uh, you will say in that day, uh, the Bayom Hahu, that future day, uh, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away, that you might comfort me. And the book of Isaiah is divided between messages of judgment and then from chapter 40 on, messages of comfort. Uh, behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord. The next verse, sing praises to the Lord. The next verse, shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. With you is how some translations put it. For the Holy One of Israel is with you. I believe that's how he ties everything from chapter 7 to chapter 12 together in a unit. That I'm telling you, God will preserve the line of the Davidic kings if it has to be through a miraculous sign. And if you don't want to hear it, 
God's going to give it to you anyhow. Even if a virgin has to conceive and bear a child, God will keep the Davidic line alive because he's going to bring the Messiah, Jesus Christ, into the world. Uh, he's the one who's going to be born of the virgin, and your contemporary Micah will tell you where in Bethlehem, and then I'm going to tell you what he's like. He's the wonderful counselor. Uh, he's the mighty God. Uh, he's the father of eternal life. He's the one who is the prince of peace. He's the one who will defeat the enemies and bring the kingdom of heaven to earth one day. Therefore, we should give thanks, sing, and shout because God is what? With us. God bless you. That's it. Now, some fatherly advice. I'll be 75 in two weeks. I've been preaching for over 50 years. Uh, you believe what you preach, people will believe it. God uses the sincerity of the message to convince people. Now, when we need to be challenged or corrected for wrong, we, we need to be honest and say something. Or we need to improve what we're trying to say. But if you preach a hesitant message, well, it might be this or it might be that, or maybe this or maybe that, Jesus himself didn't seem to like that kind of preaching. He said, that's kind of how the scribes preach. They're always quoting each other. Instead of, thus saith the Lord, uh, I'm just going to quote the Bible to you, straight up. If that was good enough for Jesus, it ought to be good enough for us. Now, we shouldn't run ahead of Jesus and make him say things he didn't say. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think we should undermine what he did say. You know the warning at the end of the book of Revelation uh, that says, uh, don't add to the words or don't take away. Everybody gets into a big textual argument over that. I think what he means is, don't make the book of Revelation say more than it says. Wild speculations. Don't make it say less than it says, as though it doesn't say these things. And I think that's true of all of Scripture. Let God be true and every man a liar. Let God's Word speak for itself and defend itself. If the early Christians believed that these prophecies in Isaiah were about Jesus, and his own disciples were quoting it, and Luke, who was taught by the Apostle Paul, was quoting it, why in the world should we give up on that? Why should we back down and say, well, I don't think it really means that, but I'm going to go around the back gate and try to sneak Jesus in? I think Barnes made a mistake with his dual fulfillment argument, and unfortunately, it eventually caught on. Not for a long time. If you look at my chart, it was almost 100 years before it really caught on with people. But when it did, it started to take off then because it seemed like an easy way to explain all of this. But when I asked myself, did Isaiah have two wives? There's nothing in the text that says he did. Did the first wife die? Nobody knows. Did he have a second wife who was a virgin, but then after she married him, she wasn't the virgin? And how does all of this work out, etc., etc., etc.? And is the child born in the next chapter the fulfillment of what he was talking about? And then the big question always is, and what was the relevance to Ahaz? I'm not sure there was any. He didn't want to hear it. But what God was saying was, in the amount of time a child could be born and come to the age of discernment, the enemy will be gone. Don't worry about it. But he was worried about it and he wouldn't listen to the message of the preacher. Then there's another option I didn't mention that's very popular in messianic circles, and that is the reference to the child who would grow to the age of discernment was referring to Shir uh, Yashib, the child he was holding in his arms. People forget the whole time he's delivering this message to Ahaz, he's holding a baby. Now, how many times as a preacher did you carry one of your kids with you to go deliver the sermon? Probably not very many times. So why was the child there? Was that the child that he was saying, by the time this child could grow to the age of discernment, the enemy will be gone and the problem will be resolved? There's no way to prove that conclusively, but it's certainly, I think, at least a legitimate consideration that ought to be given. Otherwise, why bring the kid to the prophecy? Why bring the kid to meet the king? What was the point of all of that, uh, etc.? So good people wrestle over these things. Uh, and even those that have taken other views within evangelical circles would say, I think, in their heart, I'm really trying to defend the Jesus connection here. I just don't think that 
That's what Isaiah was talking about initially. Well, if Jesus thought that Isaiah rejoiced to see his day, then I think he would have understood, uh, yeah, I think Isaiah was talking about me, and I have come to fulfill these things. And what does he say to Peter? Uh, when uh, he tells the disciples they're leaving Caesarea Philippi, I'm going to go back to Jerusalem. And they're like, no, no, that's not a good idea. They're not happy down there. Uh, you need to turn back. He tells Peter what? Get behind me, Satan. Don't you know that I must suffer first and then reign? Where's he getting that from? Isaiah. Jesus is reading Isaiah as though it's all about himself. Dare we do less than that? Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, what kind of uh, questions were asked you at your uh, examination 40 years ago? It was longer ago than that, 50 years ago. 50 years ago. Walter Kaiser was a very young professor, uh, didn't even have his doctorate yet. He was struggling at Brandeis, trying to make a Ugaritic dictionary, as I recall. Uh, that his professor threw away, uh, and uh, he started all over again, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, challenged me to think through a lot of the issues related to this. Now, my other advisor on my dissertation, Dr. Archer, basically held the dead wife, new wife view, and uh, I didn't know that uh, when I started writing, uh, and one day he said to me, I'm not in your footnotes. I'm like, you wrote a book on Isaiah? Uh, where was that? Oh, Moody Press published it. Uh, it's the uh, Wycliffe Commentary. Uh, so I went quickly and read that and thought, whoops. Uh, and so there's a very lengthy footnote in the material you received. It's about a page and a half long to accommodate Dr. Archer's ideas. Uh, but uh, I respect him. I just didn't agree with him uh, on that. And uh, the questions are always, what's the relevance of the immediate context? Uh, how can the birth of Jesus 700 years later have meant anything to Ahaz? But remember, even the prophet doesn't know the timing of the prophecy. Even Isaiah doesn't know how long it's going to be until this person's going to come. But he's convinced that he will come. What was the spur in your saddle that caused you to write about that topic at the, back then? Um, I don't know if it was a spur so much as... <laughs> Um, a little Texas lingo. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm from Michigan. We don't have spurs. Uh, <laughs> what was the ice that drove me in that direction? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Did you fall on the ice uh, one no, day? I not to. I had a professor uh, when I was a young college student uh, that uh, had lived in Israel for 20 years, from the 1920 till 1940, when the war broke out. Uh, he was a Christian Missionary Alliance uh, missionary uh, that raised support uh, to go there to witness to both Jews and Arabs. He spoke Hebrew and Arabic fluently. His name was Charles Shaw. Uh, and uh, he had studied to be a Catholic priest, was converted to Christ uh, on the campus of Boston College, a Catholic school, uh, transferred to Boston University uh, to get his doctorate, uh, and then eventually went into full-time ministry. He had such a love for the Lord and such a love for Israel and a love for the Jewish people and a love for Bible prophecy. So when I took his course on Isaiah, that drove me very much in that direction. Later I took John Whitcomb's course on Isaiah uh, at Grace. I took Dr. Kaiser's course on all the historical problems of the Old Testament uh, and uh, Messianic prophecy issues as well and benefited from all of them. All of us are really the beneficiary of those that have gone before us. Uh, centuries before, years before, many of you, your lives were shaped by a significant teacher uh, at a significant time in your life. Uh, I didn't have the privilege of going to uh, Dallas Seminary. I came to greatly respect John Walvoord when he used to come to these meetings uh, and share his humble wisdom so effectively with us. Um, but uh, God blessed me with people like Norm Geisler, uh, Walt Kaiser, John Montgomery, uh, Gleason Archer, John Gerstner, uh, and uh, 
uh, John Whitcomb and John Davis and a host of people, Jay Adams, uh, Ed Clowney, uh, and a number of others along my uh, academic journey. Being the son of an eighth grade dropout truck driver, uh, I would like to get to the bottom line and stay practical. So in all my years of study, I finished my third doctorate when I was pushing 40 and promised my wife I'd quit uh, at that point. Uh, I learned, don't believe everything everybody tells you. Check it out for yourself. Check it out with scripture. Let the Bible be the most important statement in your life and then take a look at what everybody else thinks about it, but don't be driven just by a particular viewpoint or because you agree with somebody in one area doesn't mean you have to agree with them in another area. Uh, and uh, that's a challenge for those of us that deal with uh, eschatological prophecy all the time because somebody shifts to a more reformed view of soteriology, they just assume, oh, they must be right on eschatology as well. I'll just drink all the Kool-Aid and go all the way. Uh, and uh, I would urge you, let God speak to your heart in that matter. Uh, what uh, has been, the, what, what is the history among evangelicals on the interpretation of Isaiah 714? In other words, uh, for example, do you know what Darby held or anything like that? I don't. Uh, yeah. Uh, have evangelicals always, you know, fundamentalists well, always taken yeah. that to refer? Always, basically. If you go back to the original four volumes of the fundamentals uh, that were produced back right. in the early 1900s that gave the name to fundamentalism uh, in a good sense, the basic doctrines of the Christian faith, they're defending all these things. The article in there on the virgin birth is very strong, uh, defending the reality of the virgin birth and quoting Isaiah 7.14. So in general, that has been the go-to evangelical position, and you'll still find that in most evangelical study Bibles. Uh, but then, after the influence of Barnes, you begin to see people in the middle of the 20th century changing their opinion on these things uh, and uh, by the middle of the century Archer is one of them uh, and again great respect for many of the things he said but he was one of the leaders in uh, it's both Mahar Shalom Hashbaz and it's secondarily about Jesus my concern back then if there was a burr under my saddle was yeah if you give up on seven you'll eventually give up on nine and people 50 years said, oh, no, 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 they'll never give up on chapter 9. They are now. Uh, and then you'll give up on 11. And then you'll just work your way through all the servant passages. And finally, you'll give up on 53 and you'll give up on 61. Now, there's a guy at Fuller that basically says Isaiah 61 is not about Jesus. Jesus thought it was. He <laughs> quoted it. The liberals go, no, it's third Isaiah who picks up the mantle of second Isaiah and says, God has anointed me to speak to the post-exilic community to carry things on, etc., 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 in the name of Isaiah. Now, if you've never read that stuff, one, you're probably in shock. Two, you're like, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, here's the problem. If you read a steady diet of that after a while, that starts capturing your mind. And so pretty soon you start thinking that way. And then you start thinking, oh, wow, how do I fix that? God doesn't need your help. God can speak for himself. God can take care of himself and defend himself. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, I'll go to the mics so we can get your voice on the recording. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. I uh, appreciated that very much. I just had a quick question. Most commentators will say chapters 1 through 5 form the introduction of Isaiah. Have you considered the role of chapter 6 as it relates to what follows? Uh, I, yes. I teach the book of Isaiah uh, every year at Liberty uh, to both graduate students and undergraduate students. My opinion is the first five chapters are like sample sermons to introduce the book, uh, the best of Isaiah. Because you read those chapters and boy, one's about blessing and one's about judgment and uh, you're gonna get it and then you're gonna get blessed, uh, etc. And you're like, wow, that was a wild ride. And then you don't come to the call of the prophet till you get to chapter six. In almost every other prophetic book, the call comes first. 
but in Isaiah, it doesn't come till the sixth chapter, till he has that vision of the Lord high and lifted up, uh, and the seraphim are shouting out the thrice holiness of God, the Kodesh, Kodesh, Kodesh of God. And then interestingly, when you go to the book of Revelation, John in his vision, where he's caught up into heaven, sees the same thing. The six-winged creatures shouting, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. Uh, and in Greek, hagios, 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 but the H is the breathing mark. And if you look at it in print, it's almost identical to the word for worthy, axios. Axios, axios, axios. That which is worthy is that which is agios, that which is holy. So John in the New Testament is basically taking you right back to Isaiah and right back to that same understanding that he's convinced the one Isaiah was predicting would come has now come in the fulfillment of that prophecy, etc. Then when you come to chapters 7 through 12, I think the Emmanuel prophecies are to set the whole messianic theme of the book to get us focused in that direction. Then 13 to 23, you have the prophecies against the nations. Every nation around them is going to get it. And then all of you goes, and then he says, and now Israel's going to get it. Like, whoops, where'd that come from? Uh, and uh, he's got their attention. Then you go to 24 to 27, you have what some call the little apocalypse in the book. Tribulation is coming, followed by the kingdom. Hello, that sounds like dispensational theology. Uh, and then you have the section of the woes from chapter 28 uh, to about chapter 33 or so. Uh, woes of the Massah, of the prophet's burden against the nations. I thought then, that was how you stopped your horse. Yeah, and then, yeah you do that in Texas. Uh, and then you also have another apocalyptic section. And then in the interlude, in the middle of the book, you come to the end of the Assyrian threat and the beginning of the Babylonian threat and then on to the rest of the book. So I think the first chapters are very important because I think the first five are telling you this is the overarching theme of where he's going. The judgment leads to a person which leads to a kingdom. And then the call of the prophet is that he's to announce this to the people whether they want to hear it or not because they're not going to hear it. So in the very next chapter, he has to go to the king and try to tell him what to do, and he doesn't want to hear it. God could not have prepared him better uh, in that regard. Uh, imagine yourself. You get an opportunity to speak to the president of a country, and he doesn't want to hear it. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, but uh, it's so important you tell him the truth. You can speak the truth in love, but you tell him the truth no matter what. And I think that's what Isaiah did. So do you see it as a reeve, you know, or lawsuit? That there's a, yeah, I think ultimately, yes. There's a kind of covenant lawsuit that, right. like a theological lawyer, I'm indicting you at the bar of the judgment of God that you've failed the standards of God and you've broken the law and that's why you're going to suffer these consequences. But like all the prophets, the judgment is not the end. They're not gleeful about this. Jeremiah weeps over that. Uh, they want to see redemption come. They want to see repentance come. They want to see transformation come. So ultimately, he's driving you to the message of hope that eventually the king is coming. Make a good name for a TV show. All right? Ed, as you studied the text, did you notice um, and did you put any significance to the uses of the plural and the singular in the second persons? as you go through the text, for example, in verse 9, it's plural, um, and in singular, in 11, it goes again in uh, thir 12, well, 13 through 14, then the next most important section, dealing with plurals, and then um, with 16 and 17, he goes back to the singular. Yeah. Yeah. So is he speaking... You're talking, I assume, about chapter 7. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. As he's speaking to the king about the response of the line of David, uh, and you, plural, should be responding to this, so it's not just a message to Ahaz alone, but a promise to the entire Messianic line, or the Davidic line, but then switches back uh, to uh, the singular, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Yeah, could that also be through the child that he just had, too? since he changed to a singular which it's, That's very much a possibility. Menno Kalischer argues for that, uh, and a number of the Messianic Jewish believers 
do the same. Thank you, Ed. Oh, go ahead. I fully believe that there's a lot of messianic prophecies throughout the Old Testament as this conference is highlighting, but there is a current Christological uh, movement mm -hmm. that sees Jesus throughout the Old Testament. And I am wondering where is the dividing line? And yeah. I'm not in any good, way no, diminishing the messianic right. prophecies. Yeah. No, it's a good point. They have both extremes. Uh, unfortunately, within evangelicalism, there have always been extremes. Um, I don't see any signs of the coming of Christ. Everything's a sign. Uh, whatever. Both extremes. Uh, the same is true here. I think the dividing line is your exegetical understanding of the passage. That if the passage is clearly teaching this, then it's obviously intended. If all you're doing is reading Jesus back into everything, eventually you're going to discredit that message. Uh, and there is an emphasis in many reform circles. I spent a lot of time in those circles, so I'm very understanding of them and sympathetic to a lot of their stuff. But there's a tendency to want to glorify Christ to the point that Jesus is everywhere in every verse. Now, the best message I ever heard defending messianic interpretation and against that kind of thing, Dr. Kaiser gave at the ETS meeting a few years ago. Uh, and uh, one of his funny lines in that message was, Jesus is in everything, even lamentations for crying out loud. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there I think they're overstating it. You're hypertyping everything. Also, the tendency right now in scholarship is look for parallels. And there are parallels, like we saw the parallel between Ahaz and Hezekiah. I think that's obvious, that's intended, and sometimes to the casual reader, they miss that. But again, if you're trying to force fit Jesus in everywhere, then the secular critic has every right to say, what are you doing? He's not there. Uh, you're trying to make me believe he's there. You're trying to prove too much. So it's like the old saying, he protesteth too much in some cases. So I'd be cautious uh, in that regard. Get a copy of Dr. Kaiser's paper on it. It is very, very, very helpful. Yeah, also Abner Chow has an a, a excellent book. He was here a couple of years ago uh, where he deals specifically with a lot of those issues. Now, thank you, Ed. All right. We're